caused by army bungling. From the beginning, the army had enough volunteers, but four out of five were trained to do everything but fight. When casualties were higher than predicted, cooks, clerks, mechanics, and brand new conscripts had to be given crash weapons training. The results were murderous. Some of my reinforcements. We captured an old college. There were four of us to a room, and uh, this guy started cleaning a grenade, and he put in the detonator without realizing what he was doing. And four guys were killed instantly. For the rest of the war, men with scant weapons training were sent into one of the most savage battles in history. They were almost always the first to die. This was a crucial time for the Canadian Army in Normandy. The Canadians around Caen were assigned to push the entrenched German army off the Verrier Ridge and clear the main road through Falaise to Paris. Allied Commander Bernard Montgomery was under enormous pressure from Prime Minister Winston Churchill for a breakout victory. The man of the hour was the Canadian general highly regarded by the British, Guy Simmons. Under heavy political pressure for that quick victory, Simmons was about to make some tragic mistakes. Some visiting Russian army officers asked me, by how much did we outnumber the enemy? I said, by three to one. Well, they were greatly surprised. They said they wouldn't attack unless they outnumber the Germans by at least five or six to one. Reducing the attack ratio from five or six to one down to three to one would further endanger the lives of every man in the Canadian attack. Another dangerous Simmons decision concerned one of the key members of his command team, General Rod Keller. Before the invasion of Normandy, the judgment on Keller from the Canadian Defence Headquarters was that he was incompetent to command a 20,000-man division. Keller was popular with his superiors because he was seen as tough and hard-drinking. He also had the right connections, and so he was now commanding those 20,000 men. After 30 days of intense battle, though, Keller was slowly going to pieces. On the 5th of July, 1944, British Army Lieutenant General John Crocker was asked to report on Keller's condition. Keller is not fit temperamentally and perhaps physically for such a responsible command. He is a man who has the appearance of having lived pretty well. The general state of despondency of his division is a reflection of its commander, who is showing signs of fatigue and nervousness, one might almost say, fright. To his credit, General Keller suddenly asked to be removed from command for medical reasons. The resignation went to General Simmons. I've decided to keep him. I'm about to launch a series of important attacks, and I feel the removal of Keller would sink the morale of his men even lower. As a result, Rod Keller, a general who saw in the abyss his own weakness and tried to resign, was left in command as the crucial battle of Varia Ridge was about to start. Simmons decided that the attack on a town called tilly la campagne should go in at night to keep casualties low. But here Simmons decided to improvise a new technique. He ordered searchlights to be bounced off the clouds to create what he called artificial moonlight. This was to be done without rehearsal or even properly briefing the men. As the attack was launched at 3.30 a.m. on July 25th, the improvised searchlight plan would result in sudden death for dozens of soldiers. During the attack, someone bungled and ordered the searchlights dropped to ground level, silhouetting the men to German fire. 
Jesus Christ! The Canadian regiments fought a pitched battle through the night, but the improvised planning proved disastrous for them. The machine guns of the highly trained German SS divisions decimated the North Nova Scotia Highlanders. In the aftermath of the battle, the Canadian dead littered the battlefield. But Canadian headquarters ordered the regiments to reform and attack again. The field commanders refused to follow the order. A Canadian brigadier came out to visit the battlefield, and these scenes convinced him that the attack must be called off. His name was Dan Cunningham. I couldn't send them back against the SS. It would have been murder. I decided to go and see Keller and tell him it was all off. have no chance. At Keller's headquarters, this was a key moment. Lives, careers, and the battle hung in the balance. There has to be another way. I have my orders, Brigadier, and you have your orders, sir. It was a moment of desperation for General Keller. The British generals wanted his head, but Simmons had given him another chance. Now one of his brigadiers was demanding the key Varia Ridge attack be given up. He ordered me to attack again. I told him that would be murder. He said if I didn't attack again, we'd both lose our jobs. I told him I had a law position waiting for me back in Kingston. And I was not about to sacrifice my Highlanders to save his job. In the assault on Tilly La Campagne, the Stormont, Dundas, and Glengarry Highlanders, and the North Nova Scotia Highlanders, suffered grievous losses, and then were blamed for the failure of the attack. After the battle, the military establishment closed ranks. General Keller was left in command of the division. A decision was made to blame more junior officers for the defeat, even though one man was ultimately responsible for the disastrous plan of attack, General Simmons. I ordered a court of inquiry into Tilly La Campagne. I gave the okay to Keller to sack Cunningham, Patch of the North Novies, and Christensen. Brigadier Cunningham was sent back to Canada. Courageously, he followed his conscience and was punished for it. The field officers who fought at Veria Ridge admire the courage of commanders like Cunningham commanders who know when it's time to stop. There's got to be courage at a level higher than the unit. The courage to take the decision not to do a certain thing. Courage is not only taking your sword out, going over the parapet and bashing right and left and firing your gun and so on. The, the moral courage of standing on your two feet, assessing a situation and saying, no, to say that this ain't on. Down the ridge on that same day, another regiment, the Black Watch, would follow Simmons' orders in a similar situation and discover the deadly consequences. The Royal Highland Regiment of Montreal, known as the Black Watch, is one of the most famous and prestigious regiments in Canada. Its long and bloody history stretches back to 1862. Here, the members of today's Black Watch will relive one of the darkest days in the history of their regiment. In countless battles, the Black Watch has been chosen as the regiment to lead the Canadian attack, a tradition that was built on the central philosophy of this regiment. The Black Watch 
is honor bound to never retreat. Never. In 1939, the Black Watch prepared for war with bayonet practice on the football field of McGill University in Montreal, where many were students. They wore kilts, but the volunteers came from many nationalities. The Scots and Irish were joined by Poles, Ukrainians, and lots of Americans. In London, they posed with their honorary colonel, the Queen of England. The watch symbolized the best young men Canada had to offer. One of those was Major Phil Griffin. The British Columbia native was doing his doctorate at McGill when war broke out. In England, Griffin took training very seriously. The men trusted him as a leader. Griffin became a favorite of soldiers like Bruce Duckett and Verdun, Quebec. Looks like a young college boy, put it that way. A very smart, good-looking soldier. Oh, he can be tough as nails, but very fair. However good you look, there's always room for a little improvement. Now with even more refinement, the new generation clear. St. Ivel Gold has a fresh dairy taste. And it's low in fat, so it can help you and your family stay healthier. More people enjoy St. Ivel Gold than any other low-fat spread. It's got to be good to be gold. Low-fat St. Ivel Gold. Free strawberry pavlova. That's new. It's new at Iceland, worth £2.59 and free when you buy prawns. But hurry, the Great Iceland giveaway ends Bank Holiday Monday. Morning. Morning, Dad. I'm making breakfast, Grandad. You sit here. Thank you. Cornflakes? What? A... Oh, go on then. Delicious golden flakes of corn drenched in ice cold milk. Mm. Mm. Now, can we go and play, Grandad? Mm. <laughs> There's no rush. Kellogg's cornflakes. Have you forgotten how good they taste? National savings don't pay commission to middlemen, so no one takes a cut from your money or bites from your. Assets. We don't hit you with any hidden charges. We do, however, have the investment guide to help you through the financial jungle. Snap up your free copy. Call free on 0500 500 000. The National Savings Investment Guide. Security has never been so interesting. That's it. I took a Brian's advice on the seventh horse in the accumulator. And in it came, seventh. But like my Murphys, I'm not bitter. Especially as I had a side bet on the St Barnabas steeplechase. Planning next year's summer holiday? Well, don't buy a ticket for your child. With Thompson, thousands of kids go free. You must be from Kenko. Yes, and this, this is... Uh... Most people use these beans for instant coffee. What are those? Uh, they're the best. We generally recommend those for ground coffee. Mmm, we'll buy all you have of these. What? For instance? At Kenko, we use beans for our instant coffee that we use for our ground. Hadn't I better clear that with the boss? You just have. 
Kenko. Everything we know about coffee in an instant. The men of today's Black Watch know that the story of their regiment's darkest day is a combination of bad luck, poor generalship, and tragic miscalculation. In the early morning of July 25th, 1944, they were told to advance across an open field and clear the enemy out of a French village about a kilometer away. Their top general, Guy Simmons, watched them move out from his observation post overlooking the battlefield. This was the plan from his point of view. The Black Watch were to move through the villages of Saint-Martin and Saint-André, supposedly already in Canadian hands. From there, they would attack up the hill to capture the village of Fontenay, just over the crest of Veria Ridge. On the right, overlooking the battlefield, was the town of May. The Black Watch were told it too was in Canadian hands. In fact, the Germans were there and everywhere. The entire ridge was honeycombed with mine shafts, allowing the Germans to move around the battlefield undetected. General Simmons' staff knew about the mine shafts, but didn't think it important enough to pass on to the Black Watch. In the version of this battle fed to war correspondents like Matthew Halton, Canada scored a great victory. We got forward to Canadian units which had cleaned out St. andre sur and were attacking to take Verrier and may sur -Orne. And as soon as we got into the battle, we saw tired, muddy and excited Canadian soldiers coming back with German prisoners. Scores of prisoners. And we learn this today. If you show contempt for the German, they get demoralized. They were holding us up beyond St. Andre, so we decided to ignore the snipers and go on. And when the others saw us do that, they came out with white flags. That account is about as far from the truth as you can get. Today, the battlefield looks much as it did in the hot summer of 1944. And this battle is called the Battle of St. Andre, but it really is all about crossing Verrier Ridge. Canadian Staff Behind, College Colonel right Roman Yaramowitz has analyzed the battle and discovered many details not known even by men who were fighting yeah. nearby. So, simply put, what they had to do was leave the town, advance across, get to their start line, really the crest of that ridge, and attack Fontenay-le-Marmillon. But things go wrong. The Germans are in the houses. And they can't figure out why the Germans are there. All through here are mines. And what the Germans are doing is using these mine shafts to bring in reinforcements. So you can clean out a house once, and half an hour later, they've come back into the house. You're advancing, and suddenly you're taking fire from the side. Before they know it, they've lost three, four hours. Across the battlefield, the Germans watch the Canadian approach. The infantry at May alerted me that uh, strong enemy elements had been observed north of St. Martin. The sky was sallow, Leichenlicht, dead men's light. As the Canadians moved into position for the attack, German snipers hidden in the fields carefully took aim at the senior Canadian officers. G42 machine gun like this killed the Black Watch colonel and severely wounded his second in command. Suddenly, the regiment was in the hands of the popular junior officer, 26 year old Phil Griffin. The Canadians could not understand where the German fire was coming from. jump-off point was supposed to have been cleared of the enemy. As they moved towards the town of May on their flank, most of the Germans disappeared back down the mine shafts and popped up elsewhere on the battlefield. The Canadians assumed that the Germans had retreated from the town, but in fact, the remaining Germans were just hiding and holding their fire. General Simmons was watching from afar, 
impatient with the delays. One of his brigadiers was sent to get Griffin and the Black Watch moving. What was said at this meeting is still a matter of bitter controversy. The brigadier claims he told Griffin to be cautious and make sure the villages were clear before advancing up the ridge. The Black Watch has a very different version. They say the brigadier ordered them to stop wasting time with the villages and attack straight up the ridge. Whatever was said, the brigadier left the pressures square on the shoulders of a 26-year-old major and a battalion which never retreated. He waits for the tanks, but they're late. He wants to have a squadron of tanks. They're supposed to come up to May to help him, but he can't wait any longer. So he deploys his battalion, roughly in this area. Two companies forward, they say about 150, perhaps 200 yards wide. Two companies up, two companies back. Over 325 men, the Black Watch. So on the command, realizing the tanks aren't going to be here on time, Phil Griffin says, Black Watch, advance. He picks up his hand, balls at once, and points. And the whole battalion stands up. OK, let's go. Move on. Somewhere up there is a German who's watching him with field glasses and is maintaining a solid grip in his division, saying, hold your fire, we've got a battalion coming into our gun sights. He noticed a body of infantry, about three to 400 men, uh, advanced south. This was uh, most impressive and perplexing. The soldiers were marching upright, uh, holding rifles against their breasts in readiness as if on parade drill. Despite uh, strong fire from our forces in May, uh, scarcely anybody looked for cover. It looked like waves of men rolling steadily forward. No sign of panic despite their visible losses. There was no panic, but a growing desperation as Major Griffin tried to get the artillery to fire and cover his advance. But the radio malfunctioned. Black Watch were all alone, and all alone, whole platoons began to die. Tex Richard, an American buddy in the watch, is right beside me when a shell blows him up. He says, Ducky, come help me. I says, I can't, but I'll be back, Tex, sure as hell. They did not go for cover, but kept on marching upright. To us, soldiers with four or five years of experience in Russia, this was an almost unreal sight. And the men are advancing. At one point, someone yells at Griffin, saying, we can't go on. It's murder to go on. And Griffin says, well, it's murder to stay here. Let's keep going on to the left and he keeps on advancing with the men. Griffin and a band of desperate soldiers actually reached the top of the ridge. We believe at one point in the battle, just as Griffin and roughly about 60 men crossed that crest line, that's all we think ever made it. At that point, a runner comes up to Griffin and says, they're coming, support company is coming. And, and these, as far as we know, are Griffin's last words. He tells his, tells his runner, he says, get back and tell them to send no more reinforcements. We've got too many men as it is, we're trapped. Send no more reinforcements. Tech faded out as uh, 
actually, there was nobody left over. It had been, well, sheer butchery. Corporal Duckett marched at Griffin's side until he was felled by a German shell. But that watch, we never learned the word retreat. And I didn't want to be branded a coward. I didn't want to bring disgrace on my family, on my regiment. The last picture I remember is uh, a few Canadian soldiers, mostly wounded, trying to get north. You should know, if he did not fire on the retreating men, he had been too deeply impressed and embarrassed by this sacrifice and gallantry of a battalion which had no chance against our position, no close air support, and meager artillery. I think the, the dominating feeling was, <sighs> let's these poor men get home safely. on a string of bodies, still wearing their kit, still close to their weapons, strung all the way out from their form-up point there, right up to that crest line. And beyond that, just past our line of vision, they found the body of uh, Major Griffin, surrounded with about 15 to 20 men. The rest have always been taken away. And, and this ridge is basically the end of, of the Black Watch, or at least the Black Watch for that battle. They lost well over 300 men. Uh, of the 320 that crossed their original start line, only 15 came back to be counted. For Canada, the Battle of Veria Ridge is second only to Dieppe as a catastrophe in the Second World War. Few Canadians have ever heard about it because the full extent of the calamity was covered up. The families of the soldiers slaughtered here were told only that their boy, their brother, their lover, their husband, died doing his duty on the 25th of July, 1944. All told, from Tilly on the left to St. André on the right, there were 450 dead and 1,500 wounded, many maimed for life in body or in mind. Late in the day, facing rebellion, General Simmons finally stopped sending more men. I went to see Monty and I told him I was calling off all further operations. It was not a good day. I decided against visiting the field hospitals to boost morale. It would have destroyed mine. Before the battle, the men of the Black Watch were told it was going to be a glorious breakout to surround the Germans. After the slaughter, General Simmons declared it was actually planned as a sacrifice action for the Allied cause. The survivors are still bitter about that dark day. They especially resent the attempt by Simmons and the Army to lay the blame for the regiment's death at the grave of young Phil Griffin. The army did not honor him with a medal. The epitaph comes from his family. The top reads that they might have life. The bottom reflects the family's defiant pride and all the trumpets sounded for him on the other side. Canada's first attempt to push the Germans off Verrier Ridge ended in disaster. But officers like Jacques Dextras and Radley Walters and their men found astonishing ways to turn the tide of battle and find the path to victory in the fields of Normandy 
in the late summer of 1944. and Cleo B. From £6,666. This is the original Colour Magic Car Polish from Turtle Wax, rated number one by Auto Trade magazine. It's colour enriched to blend with your car's colour. When you polish, minor scratches disappear like magic. Just pick the colour closest to your car's finish and see how Colour Magic blends in to enhance the true colour and polish off those imperfections. One easy application leaves a brilliant deep gloss shine that can last up to 12 months. The original Turtle Wax Color Magic. Seeing is believing. 51, 52, 53. From time to time, when you just can't sleep, take new Nitol. Just two tablets, and Nitol gently helps you fall fast asleep. Try new Nitol, only available from your pharmacist, and say, Good night, all. Kodak Gold Film is Kodak's greatest range of colour film ever. In all kinds of light, in all kinds of conditions, it soaks up colour like a sponge. Is your film as good as gold? New Kodak Gold Film. Wait! Before you renew your car insurance, see if the AA can give you a better deal. Call free on 0800 444 for your free quote tomorrow. Every year, British Airways brings 24 million people together. British Airways, the world's favourite airline. Call that a toothbrush? I'd call it a car wash. I think it looks different. But it's got bristles that are all different lengths. It's the new Colgate Precision. New Colgate Precision, with its unique three-bristle system, gets into the gaps, helps gently remove plaque from along the gums, and cleans so thoroughly that you can actually feel the difference. Well, how was it for you? Amazing. The plaque moved. The new Colgate Precision. Nothing else looks like it or feels like it. Elaborada desde el corazón de México. The feature packs Clio and 19 Bebop from just £6,666. Visit your Renault dealer today. In August of 1944, the Allies were far behind schedule in the battle for Normandy. The Canadian Army was still stalled around the French villages on the low ground below Verrier Ridge. Firmly ensconced on the high ground of the ridge were the crack panzer divisions of the German Army. It would take skill and courage to push them off. The tide began to turn at battles like the one for this church. The Germans were hanging on here with machine guns firing down from the steeple. The ancient walls formed an immense barrier to infantry assault, and the Canadians had been thrown back in repeated attempts to storm it. Well, you know, this bloody wall was up here. 
Jacques Dextraz was going out on leave one night when he heard there was to be another attack on the church. Dextraz was the type that often thought he had a better plan than his superiors. And on that night, his free advice cost him a good meal. Well, I was going out for dinner with a couple of the boys that night. Chicken, a couple of bottles of wine, and that was to be our evening. When I heard the battalion was to be committed at Saint Martin Fontenay, when the brigade listened to the orders and suggested that the uh, attack might be better done in another manner, promptly CO turned to me and said, "Jim, would you come down to the unit and do the battle?" So, <laughs> boy, I should have kept my mouth shut, maybe. Eh? So anyway, I reported to the unit, made a quick reconnaissance from. Uh, the top of that farmhouse over there, noticed that the plan that had been evolved uh, before I joined the unit wasn't feasible. Noticed the breach on the left flank, I said that's the way to go in. A breach is a hole in the wall? A breach was a hole in the church wall. Burst into the breach and the wall, man this side, man this side, each with machine gun. The third section started running for the door. We were firing as we were going from the hip. We got to the church, and the third section got in there, and then we threw grenades in, used our machine guns, firing left, firing right. There the surprise assault Germans worked. Dextraz chased the Germans out the back door, but he knew they would rally and be back within minutes for a ferocious counterattack. Because we were throwing grenades at them and firing machine guns. Dextraz and his men, though, and, uh, had one more surprise defense, ready. Yeah. Well, uh, we took a quick survey of the church, what it looked like, and I told them that they should place themselves in these windows, away from the floor, because the counterattack would come from pro probably that corner, and they would be really raking the floor level with uh, machine gun fire as they'd come in and throwing grenades. The church was counterattacked just as expected and the Germans driven off. It turned out to be a critical battle for control of this part of the countryside, and it won Dextraz, the Distinguished Service Order. Did you feel in awe or superstitious about breaking into a church, destroying it, throwing grenades? No, not at all. The relationship between my God and I was very intimate, you know, and I knew that my friend would understand what I was doing, you know. Uh, the Germans were in here. They had no business being there. They were in the way. They had to be gotten the hell out of it. And I think he understood. I had faith. It pulled me through the war. Oh, I didn't go down on my knees every minute and every day, but there was a little prayer that I used to say, and that was the only one. That prayer was, thy will be done. That's all. And a, a great peace came over me, because, you know, you're in front of death there. And you have to be honest with yourself. And when you say that little prayer, you have to mean it. You can't fake it. It's you and your God, you see, that's there. So uh, that pulled me through. Under fire, each man searched for his own way through the horror. Donald Pierce felt differently about God. When we were shelled, I watched others praying, and I felt sorry for them. I thought only a weak-minded person could drag theology into this stark and meaningless place. And so, instead of taking God's name into my heart, I took it in vain. Again, again, silently. Though others may have thought me praying. The Normandy War Museum celebrates the Allied victory, 
but inside you wonder how they won when you see the small allied Sherman tank right beside the large and powerful German Panther. Old Panther, a German Mark V. The sides of the Canadian tank, tank officer Radley Walters once watched a lineup of three Canadian tanks killed with one shot from the Panther's 75 mm gun. At first, the Panther seemed invulnerable, but before long, the best Canadian tank killers figured a way to stop it. All it took was what seems like a one in a million shot. If you hit on this big heavy gun mantle, and here's a pretty good example over here, where somebody's hit it, and what happens? It just bounces off. But now look over the, the armor on the driver and on your side, the co-driver. And just see how thin it is in here. Now if you can get around to come on in and hit on the lower side of this gun mantle from here, right over there, which gives you a target of about four or five feet wide, and from there down to here. The round cannot bounce off, it must bounce down. And when it bounces down, what does it do? It smashes this weak armor here over the driver and the co-driver, and in most cases, we found out that they're either badly wounded or they're killed, and the tank is automatically knocked out. Pretty small target to hit. It is, and, you know, the longer the distance and so on, but if you can get your second round, if you can't get your first one, your second round in from here down to the bottom, we found out that you could destroy a Panther with a 75 millimeter at up to eight, nine hundred yards, head on. Staff college so instructors goal, still find it astonishing. Wait a minute, General back. Rad. A six inch bullseye at 800 yards with your first shot? Sure, why not? 19 German tanks were knocked out by Radley Walters, the best kill record of any Canadian. Later in Normandy, the Allies found less risky ways of killing German tanks. This plane, the Typhoon, was the answer to many a general's prayer. Its principal mission was to hunt German Panther and Tiger tanks and kill them with rockets. This Canadian Typhoon squadron was one of several used by the Allies to counter the overwhelming superiority of the German Panzers. Establishing of air superiority, combined with other new techniques of destroying the German armored divisions, led to the destruction of the German Army of the West and the end of Hitler's last hope of finishing the war with a negotiated settlement. To some who witnessed it, the massing of Allied military power and the violent spectacle of its performance against the enemy can be compared to the performance of an orchestra. We've got artillery, medium, light, we've got aircrafts coming in, we've got typhoons. You know, it's a whole symphony, this whole thing. You go to the theater and you listen to the music that's being played. If you listen only to a trumpet, that doesn't give you much. But it's everything together that, that really uh, makes this uh, opera or this symphony meaningful to you. You can rest in your chair and you can listen to it and you say, oh, that's something. We were good with all the weaponry that we had. Some were less good than the ones he had. Maybe in some cases our tactics were a hell of a lot better than his. We believed that we had the guns to support the armament, the aircrafts, the, the artillery pieces, and our guts, apart from that, and our ability to want to do the thing. And we did it. With every day that passed in Normandy, the Allies built up more and more firepower. The Germans often displayed superior fighting ability, but eventually the Canadians used heavy bombing and relentless assaults to push Kurt Meyer's Hitler Youth Division off Verrier Ridge. had made a cemetery out of my front line. What I see now is no longer war, but naked murder. My young grenadiers, the oldest barely 18, they have not yet learned how to live. 
But God knows they have learned how to die. There is a lot of controversy about whether Canadians won their battles because of their generalship or in spite of it. Many criticized the Canadian commanders for being careless when caution was required, then being indecisive in situations demanding boldness. General Simmons never answered his critics. We won a victory, but at a great cost. Unlike the British, or the Americans, we were continuously engaged and took a higher proportion of dead and wounded. Our divisions in Normandy suffered 18,444 casualties, 5,021 killed. General Simmons was highly decorated for his role in the war. He won the Distinguished Service Order and became a companion of the Order of the British Empire. Kurt Meyer was captured and passed over to Canada for a war crimes trial. He was found guilty of complicity in the murder of Canadian prisoners by soldiers under his command. In the end, though, even the judge presiding over the military court was relieved when Meyer's death sentence was commuted. Brigadier Harry Foster. I don't believe Meyer pulled the trigger on his captives or gave orders to execute any of them. But I'm sure he knew what was happening. But does that make him any more guilty of murder than I'm guilty for knowing about the German prisoners my troops killed? Many of those soldiers who joined the Canadian Army only to get a steady paycheck in the midst of the Great Depression felt very differently about their mission at the end of the war. The North Shore Regiment's Joseph Le Boutelier discovered his patriotism in the fields of Normandy. I'm proud. An Acadian who fought for Canada. We stopped the Germans from taking over the world. Because now you're learning the tricks of the trade from experience. The first time I did that... Radley Walters went on to become one of Canada's top generals. When he tries to pass along the lessons of Normandy to today's soldiers, he emphasizes that patriotism is not enough to keep a man going through the horror of war. And I think what I learned was an awful lot about ourselves. And what I found out is that not necessarily you fight for king or queen or even country, but I found out that there's a whole bunch of friends out there, chums, and people that you had joined up with, people who you trained with, and people who you loved, really. And therefore, when the chips are down, nobody but nobody was going to leave the other guy down. Canadian soldiers who watched their best friends die carry their own heavy burden of the memory of that battle. Donald Pierce was haunted by the ancient epitaph of Roman warriors. Dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. How sweet and good it is to die for one's country. I think of those I knew, now dead. There was something sweet about their death, and glorious. We must all go at last, and they went, followed by men who labored with them and loved them. All this a civilian can never know. Every Canadian, whoever comes to France, should just walk up there and spend a minute by himself and realize that the number of, uh, 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 of Canadians that died on that hill was just exceptional and their bravery in trying to get there and maintain the pressure was just beyond anything one can imagine. Fervent chrétien, 
Pierre et braves soldats reposent dans la paix du Seigneur. <laughs> 16 years old. A child. <laughs> well, son, we owe you a lot. In this cemetery beside Verrier Ridge are buried 2,793 Canadians. Some are in unmarked graves, many have no epitaph, and the sacrifice of all of them is too often forgotten in their homeland. The poet Houseman wrote, Here dead we lie because we did not choose to shame the land from which we sprung. Life, to be sure, is nothing much to lose. But young men think it is, and we were young. Before the age of package holidays, this man followed uncharted rivers, lived the life of a Bedouin. I wanted the freedom of Bedou life. Fought with the SAS, 